Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow. Good morning. We are growing here at Namaste. I, let me turn the thing around here so you all can see everybody. Everybody wave. God's army. We are definitely a full community at the moment, and it is wonderful. The, the meals are, the dining room is full, the session room is full, and we feel the energy and the activity, the activity of spirit moving through us. We are very grateful, and we are also grateful for the rest of you who join us from around the world. It's so great to know that there's this whole network of powerful, strong intention, a single intention to awaken, to realize, to see as God sees, to love as God loves. I think that's the simplest we can put this, to learn how to see everything as God sees, and in doing so, to learn to love as God loves. Of course, God's, whatever God is, you know, we talk about that sometimes. We, we can't define that. There's no being out there who's looking down on us, judging us. But there is love itself, the essence of love itself, which is everywhere in every moment. And the love that loves us, this is our experience. St. Francis once said, why is love not loved? Isn't that beautiful? He looked around his world and, and he saw so much division. He saw so much discord and battling and positioning. And brought it down to such a simple question. Why is love not loved? In other words, why can't we do such an obvious thing? Why can't we feel something that is so clear? Love which is everywhere, and yet we block and we divert and we, we, we use love as a weapon instead of realizing that love is what we are. It's what created us. We are the extension of the love and the loveliness of God. That's the truth. And in loving any part of that extension is loving the whole thing. Why is love not love? We look at the world today, and in many ways, it's, it's similar to as it was in the time of Francis, 800 years ago. Where there, I mean, at that time, the town next to you could be a completely different political system, and you'd be at war with the next town overnight. The next town would invade. And everyone would have to escape. They'd have to escape in the case of Assisi through a, a system of tunnels that went through the, the underground of Assisi up to La Roca, which is the castle at the very top. And they would wait there for the battle to be over. And that was just coming from the next town. I remember once I was in Assisi and had a group there and, and we decided that we were going to find some way into those tunnels because they're all blocked off, but we were determined we were gonna find our way into those tunnels. And we tried, we, we, you know, we spent days doing this. And, and there were a couple of times when we found an entrance, but then you'd go into it and it would be blocked a few feet later. I'm getting off subject here, but I'll, I'll find a way back, I'm sure. But I do remember there was this lovely couple that was, on the trip with us and they were both from like west virginia or something and the the man i don't remember his name but we're going to call him bubba because he was one of those guys you know usually had a pinch between his cheek and his gum and talk like this but he was the nicest guy lovely man and one of the things that we learned was that during world war ii there was an, a, a thing called the Assisi Underground. And the, the Franciscans would hide Jews in these tunnels uh, to help them get out of Italy. And the Nazis were like right above walking the streets, having no idea. 
that all these Jewish men and women and children were hidden beneath. And so we're going around trying to find uh, these tunnels, and I'm with a friend of mine named Steve, um, and we see Bubba, and, and he seems to be in a very uh, difficult conversation with a shopkeeper. So we walk over to, to see what's happening, and the shopkeeper has this very confused look on his face, and, and, and Bubba keeps saying, where do y'all keep your Jews? <laughs> No comprende. No understand. You're Jews. Where do you keep them? <laughs> so I bet you're wondering now how I'm going to swing back somehow from that. Well, today's, here we go. I think I got it. Uh, today's lesson is going to be about shadows. The shadows that we all hold that help us to misidentify who we are and what everything else is. And we, we hide the truth of who we are in the shadows. And we think that we literally are the shadow that we project, like projecting a shadow onto a wall or a floor. Of course, we all know the, the great um, Plato, it was Plato's analogy of the cave. You all know that one? Okay. I won't repeat it because it's pretty common. Everyone knows about the Plato cave analogy. I mean, he used shadows to demonstrate the difference between understanding and experiencing reality and looking at a shadow and thinking it's real, right? And so all of these, we, we have these shadows, uh, uh, national, uh, we have world shadows like what happened, as I just mentioned, with the Holocaust and other terrible things that have happened. These are all aspects of the shadow. We all have them in our own personal lives as well. So we're going to talk about that and, and how we can shed shine the light on them all so that we can see through the shadows into the light. So let me go ahead and bring this up so you can see. So the unreal shadow. Ultimately, that's what we're here to realize and to experience. The shadows aren't real. We can believe or pretend that they are real, but they on their own have no substance, no lasting substance. So your determination to see what isn't really there has convinced you that it's possible for nothing to exist. Once again, your determination to see what isn't really even there, this is what's convinced you that it's possible for nothing to exist, for a shadow to be something rather than a nothing. It's impossible for nothing to exist, and the instant you realize that, you will open your eyes and see, see the real world. When you give up the attempt to try and prove that nothing can be something, and allow what is true, what is real, what is whole, what is permanent, what is eternal, to be the only thing that you focus on. Then you will open your eyes and you will see that there is a whole world that you have been close to until now. A world of freedom, a world of light. It's like, as we're going to hear this analogy of a shadow being cast on the ground, you've, been, you've had your back to the light, and you're seeing this shadow cast upon the ground and you misidentify and think that I am that, I am that shadow. And look, it, it, must, it must be real because it, it moves its arms, but it only moves its arms when I move my arms. It has no life of its own. And it's only when I turn around and face the light that I can see reality. I am able to perceive what is real. So all we are asked to do is to turn, 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 like the song. To turn back toward the light. To turn away from shadows. And in doing so, we demonstrate the reality of that experience. In doing so, we demonstrate true freedom, true happiness, true joy. Because... The I am within us is revealed. The I am presence within us opens and awakens. 
And the heat of that experience becomes so palpable that everyone senses it when they're near us and they know that that's what they want. They know that that's what they're longing for. We want to be around realized beings, people who are on fire. And the beginning of that fire is when we turn around, turn away from the, the projection of our minds. We've been talking about projection a lot lately. Projecting a shadow upon the ground, believing it's real, we turn around to see reality. Okay, once again, you look, you look at a shadow and claim that it's alive. It moves and it dances, but never on its own. A shadow is nothing more than the manifestation of blocked light. The manifestation of blocked light, which is exactly what your self-identity is. Your self-identity, who you claim to be, is nothing more than the manifestation of blocked light. It's not real, just as the shadow is not real. It doesn't move on its own, just as the shadow doesn't move on its own. But you identify with it. And in identifying with the shadow, you believe there's a reality where there is none. You try to make nothing exist. Okay. It moves and it dances, but it never, but never on its own. A shadow is nothing more than the manifestation of blocked light, which is act, exactly what your self-identity is. Does knowing that the you that you believe you are doesn't really exist make you feel angry? Maybe. Or does it fill you with profound joy? That's a good question. Does knowing that your self-identity is really nothing more than a shadow of who you really are. Does knowing that the you that you believe yourself to be, it doesn't really exist, does that make you feel angry? Or does something open and awaken and shift within you and, and, and you, you feel the movement of, I knew it, I, I felt it all along. I just... I didn't know if I should believe it or not because everything in the world tells me the opposite. When you begin to realize that everything in the outside world tells you the opposite of who you are, that's when you know you're on the right track. <laughs> We've been doing this class on Joel Goldsmith lately, which I'll be sending out to all of you at some point. It's been fantastic because I, I, I read it and, and, and it's like, who could write this? Only an illumined being could write this because it goes in the face of everything we've ever been told about who we are, what the world is for, what everything is about. But when we hear it, even though it's the opposite, something begins to move within us. A joy begins to awaken within us. A fire is enlivened within us. That's how we know it's true. Because every part of the truth within you is, is longing for the return to love, longing for the return to grace. And when it feels that shift back in that, when you, and it feels that shift back toward the light, something wake awakens, a fire begins to burn and you feel it and you know it. Okay, does knowing that the you that you believe yourself to be doesn't really exist make you feel angry or does it fill you with profound joy? If you feel the approach of this joy, then you're very close to breaking free from the chains that have held your identity in place for so long. You're very close indeed. A shadow has no life of its own, but you can certainly imagine that it does. Your imagination has the power to see whatever it wants to see, but it cannot make the unreal real. It can only imagine that the unreal is real. That is beyond your power. And you're only now beginning to realize that. And the more you realize this fact, the more obvious the real world will become. The more clear you will begin to see. I remember when I was about 18, I thought I saw everything perfectly clearly. I had no idea that I was short-sighted until a friend who had glasses, I said, 
yeah, I want to see what I look like if I had glasses and I put on his glasses. Suddenly everything came into perfect focus. <laughs> but I didn't know that until I put on the glasses, until I chose to receive the help, the guidance. This is what the Holy Spirit's guidance is all about. It's like putting on glasses and suddenly I see that which has always been so clear, but I wasn't seeing it clearly. But now I am. So we're all putting on the, the corrective glasses that the Holy Spirit offers us so that we can see truly. Okay, a little bit more. Until now, you've been afraid to look at this, but a sufficient amount of light has come into your mind for you to see what has always been seen by God. This is who you are. This is where you are, each and every single one of you. A sufficient amount of light has come into your mind so that you can now see what has always been seen by God. Uh oh Everybody check, make sure you're muted. Muted, someone got unmuted. I can, I can hear you in the background. Okay. A sufficient amount of light. But what has always been seen by God is the only thing that's real. What has always been seen by love, we'll say, is the only thing that is real. And you are that. That's what God looks upon, the truth of you, not the self-made identity, which is really the manifestation of black light. God looks upon the truth of you, the wholeness of you, the holiness of you, and says, yes, each and every single one of you, yes. And we can choose to, to live within that yes right now, if we want, or we can go back another three or four, 30 or a thousand lifetimes and continue to spin, continue to just be on that treadmill that goes nowhere. But why? See, when a sufficient amount of light comes into your mind as it has, there is no why. Like now I know uh, the light is now sufficient in my mind for me to realize what I have given up, what I have sacrificed. And when that happens, <clears throat> you can never go back. That's where you are now. So honor that. Bless that. Keep moving forward. Resist the urge to fall back into those old patterns where you believe you're just a shadow. Okay. What has always been seen by God is the only thing that's real. And you are that. You are the extension of God's love. And luckily, there's nothing that you can do to alter that fact. Try as you may, and trust me, you have, we all have, we have tried really hard to alter the truth of who we are, and this is the greatest failure in the universe. You tried and you failed. You are as God created you. Nothing can change. You can create all sorts of illusions that seem to prove that you're different. Do you realize that's all perception is, is the will to change the will of God, but you cannot change the only will that exists. And that will is love. And that will is perfection. And that will is wholeness. And you are that. So I'm going to turn it over to Vicki and let her pick it up from there and take it back into the practical. Good morning, Victoria. Good morning, Brother James. Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you all. I love this week. Thank you so much, Jimmy, for really focusing on basics. So here's the um, Cliff's notes on what you said. <laughs> <laughs> so the shadow to me is nothing but the story of a separation pictured out. It's, that's all it is, and it's the guilt we feel for having a will to leave heaven. How foolish, but we did. Having a will to leave heaven, forget about having God create us, forget all that, and make up our own storyline. And now we've got the storyboards all around us. It's the storyboard of our will to be separate from God. 
That's all it is. And feel guilty about it. That's why it's full of punishment and all kinds of things. So that's all it is. But the answer, so that's all the shadow is. That's the world of time and space. Very simple little, that's it, little storyline. Oops, I, I decided I wanted to play my own game. That's not so much fun, I found out. The way the light comes in, and that's the crack. Someone wrote a book, The Crack and the Cosmic Egg. Do you remember that book? Mm -hmm. the, the crack of light that comes in is simply love. What it, that's all light is. So what I learned to do, keep company with love. When we were talking yesterday to abide in love, to gaze upon love, to enjoy the present moment with love, to keep company, the self-talk that we do, don't talk to yourself anymore. It's awful lonesome. Talk to your best friend. Talk, I talk to Jesus. Jesus, he's my lifetime buddy. Somehow I came in with him in my heart, in my mind, all over me. And that's it. He's my, and when um, Alice, I don't, Alice isn't here today. When Alice told that story yesterday, that dream that someone had up in the elevator and you get, oh yeah, you see, there's heaven right there. But Jesus says, nope, you got to go right back down. Because, this was the reason, because God does not go against our will. If we want to have a will to play some stupid game that can't be played anyway, but we want to try it, he will not go against us because of the law of creation is freedom. That's what freedom is. So what Jesus does, yeah. yeah, make it real. Jesus says, we're going to go all back. And we're going to walk up the mountain together and look at all, all the places you thought something outside of you was more fun than heaven. Every place you believed in that was going to give you some kind of happiness, more than what you already are, you're going to choose again. You're going to say, you know what? That was a bad choice. I see that. I'm not going to have any more hidden will for separation. There's a very deep unconscious within us where we have pushed this down so much. It's not the superficial unconscious that we have, you know, my mother, my father, my sister stuff. It's a deeper level of the collective unconscious that Jung was talking about. That deeper level of collective unconscious harbors this de desperate guilt and fear and a death wish comes with it. That's why we all end up dying here. So all we had, the, so I always focus on the answer. I don't care how we get there. I just know that the answer is imminent and it's right now. And any time, any moment, we become present to love in whatever experience comes to us, in a flower, in a friend, mostly pay attention to the self-talk. Talk with the eternal, talk with, you know, Buddha, Moses, Wayne Dwyer, Dyer, Mickey Mouse, talk to a being of love and keep your, your self-talk in a communion of love. I don't even get dressed without checking in, like Jesus, Holy Spirit, what do I wear today? What color works today that will remind me of who I am? Oh, pink, okay. I, it's like, do ever, let your life be happy. Let our lives be playful together. Let our lives be full of love. The reason that there are so many brothers right now in this room, Jimmy, it's because we love you. That's the truth. There isn't one, brother here, sister or brother, that is here for really any other reason. It doesn't matter what we say, <laughs> you, me, Teddy, anybody. It's like, it's we're just the sideshow to open up that portal of love. And um, Jimmy, we all thank you always for being being the that gateway and that portal so that it opens in us. And that's what happens. Even though we don't talk to each other, we don't necessarily hear one another, because we have a communion of one purpose, to find the truth in spite of the appearances of the story, the shadow, that one goal has brought us into a state of love. And thank you for harnessing that to me. So stay in love. Don't settle for anything less. When Francis said, why don't we love love? Well, let's just do it. Let's love love today. That's all. Amen. <laughs> let's love love. So simple. By the way, uh, before we go to Teddy, I want to mention uh, something that we've been, a few of us have had fun with. And you talked about Alice's uh, talking about the elevator dream. 
yesterday. And we, we do have these dreams or these experiences uh, that seem scary, but are really meant to teach us that we're perfectly safe, that no matter what happens, we are safe, we are held, we are protected. And so a lot of you know that I, I work sometimes with virtual reality glasses, right? And some of us have been having fun with a new program that I have on my VR glasses. And I'll describe it to you basically. Um, and it's so real. I mean, that's the thing about it. It is so real. You're, you're, you're looking around like, holy mackerel. Look, they're the birds and they're flying. I can, you're, you're seeing everything in, from every direction, totally real. And you first, you find yourself standing outside and then you turn around and then there's an elevator door and you step inside the elevator. And then there's, there's a button that says plank. And you push the button. Literally, you take your hand and you push the button. The elevator door closes. You hear this elevator music, and, and you can actually see through the little crack in the door as, as the different floors go by. So real. The door opens. Now, you have to know that most people, when the door opens, that's where the fun begins. Because, like, uh, the door opens, and the typical reaction is, oh, no. Oh, no. I am not going out there. Because what you see, the door opens, and you're... You take one step and you're outside and there's a plank that just goes straight out about six feet, maybe. And, and you're challenged to walk the plank. I actually, I, I did this um, yesterday with, with Dia because we've been going through a, a healing retreat and, and I wanted her to have the experience of no matter what, you are protected. You cannot get hurt. I am here. And, and like everyone else, she felt that fear because it's you feel the fear as if you really are walking that plank. But she had courage and she started to take steps and you start to feel a little un, you know, unsteady. I am here. I'm right behind you. You cannot fall. In fact, even if you jump off, you're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> and she walked the plank. I said, okay, now turn around and walk back in. And she turned around and she walked back in. Still like, oh, it's so real. But it's not. This is such a great example of, you know, actually the glasses are virtual, virtual reality. This is the virtual reality. Because no matter what, the truth of you cannot be hurt. Even if something happens to your body, all of that. The truth of you is whole, is protected. The Holy Spirit is there, just as I was with Dia, holding, just saying, I got you. You're not going to fall. I promise you, you, you are safe. Anyway, I thought of that when you mentioned uh, the dream from, from Alice. It's just another way of realizing that no matter what it seems like, just like we're wearing glasses, we're standing in a, on a totally flat, and, but we feel like we're way up on a hundredth floor of a building getting ready to fall off it. You're safe. Nothing's going to happen to you. I got this. So, Teddy, what do you want to share? Well, there's a lot that could be said about this. But one of the things, well, there's a couple of things. Number one is, now I'm forgetting. <laughs> well, it's in good oh, condition, oh, oh. don't worry. Well, um, you know, what it says in the Course, and, you know, Jesus being my best friend, I read the Course, what it says is everything and nothing cannot coexist. One or the other is true. So everything and nothing cannot coexist. The other thing it says is, where is the darkness when the light has come? And the other part is, everything here is a decision. So if God is light, then there is only light. Now, because what Vicki was saying, we have the power to think in opposition to God. We cannot make the opposition true. So it's just our own thoughts. So everything that you wrote before, the ideas of there being something other 
than light are nothing but ideas in our own mind that we have chosen as decisions to believe. And just as easily we can unchoose to believe our own decisions. And as we got the now, the good news is the idea that we got the result of those decisions, even though they're false, prove to us we can get the result of the decisions if we choose correctly and allow there to be only light. So we can use the falsity as a training to see the power of our mind so as to choose wisely as opposed to wrongly about what exists and what God is. So therefore, what we are as an extension of God, as an extension of the light. We are the light of the world simply because there is only light. We can think we're not, but we can't make that not true. We are the light of the world, and we can come to know that by changing our mind. That's the entire nature of the Course. You can change your mind from believing the false to recognizing what is true is true, and only truth is real, just as we say, only everything and nothing cannot coexist. Only the everything is real. And we can choose that everything with every thought. And we will show ourselves that we were wrong. And there's an instant when we recognize that we were wrong about anything, that we were wrong about everything. And in that instant of recognizing we were wrong about everything, the light rushes in and we come to know ourselves as one with God and our brothers as that too. Thank you. When we believe what we see, we will also feel that. We will feel it as if it's real, whether it's real or not. To, our, to the mind that we have chosen to think through, that doesn't matter the perceptual mind. We believe what we see and we feel that which we think we see, whether it's real or not. The example of that virtual reality game is, is just that. There's a part of you that knows I'm still standing here in the ground. I, I have not actually gone up in an elevator. I am not actually walking out on a plank, but because you see it and it seems very real, you feel it. Does that make sense? You feel as if you are literally teetering on a little plank about this wide, walking about six feet out on a hundred story building. At no time is that true. At no point are you in danger, but you feel that you are. That's why uh, some people here they just, they literally refuse to step out of that elevator. I'm not, I'm not going, no, no. Because, and this is such a good way of understanding how we deal with perception. We believe what we see and then we feel what we think we're seeing. We feel the danger, we, we feel fear, we feel whatever it is, even though at no time did we go up that elevator. <laughs> we're still right there in the ground. And, and the, the other thing is, everyone else is standing around laughing at you <laughs> because you look so funny. <laughs> and, and if you want, by the way, you can actually go to YouTube and if, and if you type in plank uh, uh, and just experiences, maybe you, you can, the, people put up videos of their buddies doing this and it's hilarious. <laughs> It's so funny to see these big football players or whoever may be refusing to step out of an elevator that isn't even there. I'm not going. No, I'm not going. Make, make that door close. 
All right. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Teddy. If anyone here wants to walk the plank, you let me know later. <laughs> I call Dave, you had something really quick to say. What was that? I have a little song to share. And it's inspired by one of Vicki's favorite mantras. There is no spot where God is not. <laughs> so it goes like this. There is no spot where God is not. 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 And then, so, so I was singing this as I was skiing down the mountain the other day, and some movements came as well. And before I knew it, there, we had a new dance of universal peace. So it goes like this, so you can join if you like. There's no spot where God is not. 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 Hot. <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't do the movements while I was skiing down the mountain. <laughs> Good. I think, I think I would have been stopped by the ski patrol. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Call Dave. And thanks to all of you. What a blessed beginning to our day. Thanks to all of you here at Namaste Village. Thanks to all of you Namasteers around the world. And Namaste Go. So we. <laughs> namaste. Get it? It's a joke. Namaste. Namaste Go. <laughs> So let's do our prayer of protection. And you are welcome to. Oh, okay. All right, I'll share the screen. Here we go. The light of God surrounds us. I am the light of God. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love of God. The power of God protects us. I am the power of God. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence of God. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. So it is. Thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful day. We'll see you tomorrow. Happy Wednesday. Bye-bye. Thank you.